Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> As Alex said, it is also a great pleasure for me to be here to uh, discuss a topic that is one that uh, I have spent uh, some time uh, looking at, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, discussing this topic further uh, today with you. Um, it's uh, an important uh, time for women in politics at the moment. Uh, in an international context, uh, the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women is currently uh, planning its agenda for the post-2015 period uh, where the Millennium Development Goals will be reset and reframed. And in an early briefing paper in uh, supporting that discussion, uh, the Commission on the Status of Women have identified the role of women and the inclusion of women in decision making and in all spheres as being a central uh, objective uh, uh, for their activities into the future. Um, we also have an electoral cycle locally uh, and nationally uh, that is beginning to uh, uh, take place from uh, May 2014 this year onwards and that's going to last for two years and the issue of women's underrepresentation in political life is going to continually raise itself it certainly will be an issue that will be addressed in the media it has been an issue that has been widely addressed in civil society here in Northern Ireland for the last two or three years and it is a, a matter that political parties are increasingly turning their attention to. So it is a topic that is not going to go away. Uh, and I think um, illustrative of the fact that it's not going to go away is uh, the debate, the plenary debate, that was held in the Assembly on the issue that uh, Mr Lunn referred to in his opening remarks. And very interestingly, when I read that debate, uh, I could see that there was a lot of cross-party consensus on the issue. There may have been different emphases in different areas, but there is no doubt that there was uh, a strong cross-party uh, agreement around uh, the theme, uh, agreement that something must be done to address this. And I would contrast that very much with uh, the debate that was held um, a number of years ago, which proved to be a very contentious one. So it goes to show that as the Assembly is settling down and as politics is settling down uh, in Northern Ireland, that issues such as women's underrepresentation as a democratic uh, politics issue is coming more and more to the fore. And that it should come to the fore is very obvious from the statistics. Um, here we have a chart showing the representation of uh, women in the last um, four assembly elections and elections to the devolved assemblies and legislatures um, across uh, Britain and Ireland. And you can see that in each case, the Northern Ireland Assembly is quite some way behind the other assemblies in terms of uh, the representation. It's been below 20%. It has never breached uh, the minimal 20% mark. Um, yet all the others have um, had a representation of at least one third and even up to 50% in the case of the National Assembly for Wales at one instance. But what this chart also shows is that gains made at one election, such as in uh, Scotland and Wales, are not necessarily maintained. And this is an issue that has to be continually worked on so that uh, uh, gender balance in political representation uh, uh, is uh, upheld and uh, maintained. We find 
Again, appropriately uh, for uh, today's discussion, um, concern at local level as well, where the representation of women in local councils in Northern Ireland has gone from uh, about one in 10 back in the 1989 uh, to about um, one in four today, just under one in four councillors are women today. Um, yes, that is progress, but it's progress over a long, long period of time. And we know that uh, the council's uh, election is taking place under conditions of, um, uh, of reform, and the number of councils is going to be reduced um, at the next elections. And that means that the um, gains that have been made for women's representation at local level may not be maintained. There is no guarantee that there is going to be a minimal threshold of 25% of uh, the seats being uh, filled by women in the new councils. So these are issues that uh, we need to address and it's very clear that um, if we are to uh, even begin to move up in the uh, parliamentary rankings, uh, we have to do something about it. If the uh, Assembly were a national parliament, it would rank 77th in the world today. Uh, 77 out of about 180, uh, there's 180 countries in the world, presume there's 180 parliaments, not all of them are democratic, at least about 120, 125 of them are democratic, so we don't even make the uh, half, uh, halfway mark in that regard. Now, there are many reasons uh, why women's representation has, uh, has been low, and they have been um, uh, widely examined, uh, both in terms of Northern Ireland and in terms of the international uh, context. Um, when we look at Northern Ireland, there are two very obvious macro factors that, um, uh, that present themselves. The first one is that three decades of conflict have meant that a particular kind of politics has been pursued for a long period of time that has, uh, in a way, um, narrowed the space through which um, conventional democratic party politics have been able to take place. Um, so the practice of politics and the shaping of what constitutes politics in Northern Ireland is very much conditioned by the legacy of the past and influences the politics of the present. And so that has an effect on women's and men's connection with politics in Northern Ireland, as we will see uh, uh, quite shortly. Um, the second big macro uh, uh, condition is the whole area of culture. Um, when we look at culture, we think of culture as being um, a rule book or um, uh, a, uh, an, an agreed set of norms through which we learn how to behave. And those norms often reinforce gender stereotypes, which again reinforce gender inequalities and affect women's aspirations to many areas of life, including politics. And so we have to look at the, base, the culture base around which politics uh, uh, is uh, defined in Northern Ireland. So within those two macro contexts, we have a number of individual circumstances that interrelate with them in, uh, in quite uh, uh, complex ways uh, to, uh, if you like, depress uh, the supply side of women into the political system. And these are critically and have been found right across the world to be issues such as cash, such as finance for running electoral campaigns, for feeling that one can participate in an electoral process. 
Um, the second is confidence, that if uh, women feel that they belong in the political sphere and that they uh, are uh, sure that their abilities and their skill sets can be uh, utilised to affect in the political sphere. Um, which very much again goes back to the interaction with gender stereotypes and what their society perceives that women and men uh, are, is socially appropriate for them to do. Uh, the other big question is the question of uh, caring responsibilities, again interlinking with culture and in a Northern Ireland society obviously uh, caring responsibilities are very much uh, seen as being the primary task of women uh, and traditionally have been seen in that way. So there needs to be uh, a, a discussion and a debate about uh, breaking down that particular barrier uh, towards a more equal caring, uh, sharing of caring responsibilities. So those uh, three issues, the cash, the confidence and uh, the caring responsibilities interact with the cultural environment and interact with the political environment uh, more broadly to condition uh, the opportunities for women to enter the sphere of electoral politics. On the other side, we have the system-based uh, uh, element, um, which is looking at party selection processes and the signals that parties themselves send out about whether they are looking for women to run as candidates or not, whether they are open to nurturing and developing the talent of their own women members to become uh, representatives for the party at some point uh, in, uh, in the party's uh, uh, plans, strat plans for election. And so the party demand for uh, uh, women to be equal partners in the um, political sphere, sends out subtle messages to women in society and women in the community more generally as to wh whether those parties are open to receiving uh, interest from women who wish to uh, share in the governance of Northern Ireland. Um, it certainly does have an influence on party selection practices and procedures, but it is again part and parcel of party cultures and party orientations and party openness uh, to including women. And different parties have different positions on all of that, and that often gives rise to quite lively debates uh, across uh, Northern Ireland. Um, but there are... Um, Many reasons other than very utilitarian ones, such as getting more votes, um, which uh, influence um, the rationale for having uh, the equal participation of women and men in elected office. First of all, as we know, equality is a fundamental democratic principle. And increasingly, equality in democratic politics has become reshaped and redefined as a matter of justice, a matter of gender justice, and a matter of social justice. Um, because um, increasingly, throughout the late 20th and early 21st centuries, um, democracies and polities have been revisiting whether their democracies are fit for purpose or not for the 21st century. And in looking at whether democracies are fit for purpose, the issue of women's status in society and women's representation in political life as a marker of women's status in society has come much more to the fore, not just in Northern Ireland, but right across uh, democratic societies across the world. Um, and then there are the governance reasons 
for having equal numbers of women and men in a parliament, in an assembly. Uh, one is to enhance the diversity of the perspectives that contribute to solving and uh, debating the uh, uh, challenges that that society uh, confronts and that that parliament and those elected representatives uh, seek to address. Uh, so, as a lot of management uh, uh, research and a lot of research in many spheres now shows, having a diverse team contribute uh, uh, pers many perspectives and multiple perspectives on a particular policy issue ensures that the decision that is taken around that policy issue is one that probably is the best one for that situation at that point in time. Um, it's been found throughout uh, uh, business, for example, that the more diverse a team, uh, a senior management team is in making decisions for companies, actually the more profitable those corporations become. There's a 20% dividend for corporations and multinational companies in having a diverse team. And diverse means uh, diverse in terms of gender, in terms of perspectives of different kinds. Uh, the same applies in political life. Um, the more uh, attention that is given to a problem from multiple uh, perspectives, the better. And the better those parties are able to represent their constituents. The second point in terms of governance uh, questions is that women themselves, because of their differential socialization patterns to men, can often give voice to women's specific issues and address women's specific concerns that may not otherwise be addressed in a male dominant parliament or assembly. And this is uh, clearly shown in many assemblies. So for example, if, uh, if a male dominated assembly um, truly represented women's interests in society, the issue of childcare as a policy issue would have been solved 100 years ago. Um, so these are issues that require the perspective of women in the debating chamber to contribute to the better shaping of laws and policies for Northern Ireland and indeed, that issue goes more generally uh, for all uh, parliaments and for all societies. Um, so these are quite often the arguments that are raised for having more women in politics and political life in addition to the uh, utility factor. Um, and increasingly, um, parties and assemblies and uh, think tanks and international organizations have tried to come up and have uh, with various forms of plans in order to be able to address uh, uh, this, uh, this underrepresentation. So for example, uh, the Council of Europe had a recommendation in 2003 on the balanced participation of women and men in political and public decision making. And balanced participation is defined in that recommendation as 40% of either gender, of either male or female. Um, and subsequently, many other um, uh, um, parliaments uh, looked at that recommendation and looked at the guiding uh, supports related to that recommendation and applied them in their own contexts. We again have the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which again guarantees women the right to full and equal participation in political, public and civic life along with men. And that's been on the statute books since uh, and uh, signed up to by all parliaments and by all governments since uh, 1979. So, 
obviously there's still th these issues still need to be addressed. But uh, Pippin Norris and Mona Lena Crook, having taken a wide overview um, of all of these areas, uh, came up with the broad um, uh, arenas in which um, action plans that ha have been initiated to address this question. And you can see the six areas there in terms of where parliaments and societies have addressed uh, this kind of area. And all of them have relevance to Northern Ireland. Um, some I will focus on more, the last three I'll focus on more later in my talk, but all six have relevance to Northern Ireland. So, for example, in terms of constitutional rights, um, the 1998 agreement provides in fundamental rights section that women will have the right to full and equal participation in political life. Uh, along uh, with men, again echoing the UN uh, CEDAW uh, convention. Um, and so that um, guarantee of full and equal participation is something that we still need to work on in Northern Ireland and I think there is, as I say, a lot of concern that we do address this, this issue um, much more fully now uh, than we have in the past. The electoral system is very interesting. In Northern Ireland, the proportional representation system with multi-member constituencies, six member seats, is actually, in theory, very favourable to women's representation. Uh, much more so than the first-past-the-post system, which is a winner-takes-all system and, um, uh, and has an inbuilt um, uh, bias in favour of male candidates in it. So we have a plus here in terms of the electoral system in Northern Ireland. Um, my concern would be that the uh, multi-member seat number not drop below six because if it drops below six, then the competition that is engendered between political parties for uh, votes actually begins to, it begins to veer more towards a winner takes all or first past the post system in the sense of encouraging male candidates rather than encouraging f the selection of female candidates. So I think it's very important to it to, as a minimum, keep the six-member per constituency uh, system in place along with the STV system that we have. Legal quotas. Well, elections are, as we know, and the rules for elections are, uh, 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 are a matter that is outside the remit of the Northern Ireland Assembly. But nonetheless, the Sex Discrimination Election of Candidates Act in 2002 <coughs> applies to parties in Northern Ireland. Um, and it provides for the... Uh, for the parties to take positive action, which means that parties, if they so wish, can institute their own internal uh, quota or their own internal target for candidate selections in terms of uh, gender. So in that regard, uh, Northern Ireland has parties have the capacity to have legal positive uh, actions that enable them to be proactive uh, in, in uh, candidate selections uh, that will increase women's uh, representation. Some parties um, are, uh, do look at uh, implementing um, uh, targets for uh, the selection of women candidates. Other uh, parties don't. It's very much up to the culture of the party, but the legal framework is there enabling to do to, for that to happen. Um, I think 
getting more into the nitty gritty of it, issues such as party rules and recruitment processes very much structure women's opportunities for being selected, um, which I'll go to in, in, into some more detail. Um, developing the capacity of parties and of women themselves and of parliamentarians to recognise that gender equity is an issue that must be addressed, is an important aspect, and parliamentary reform again, another area that is well worth looking at in terms of the Northern Ireland Assembly. But more generally, each of these six issues interact with one another to provide a whole range of procedural and supportive actions that will encourage and uh, contribute to increasing women's representation in political life. So, looking at uh, parties in particular, um, when we look at internal party quotas, sometimes these are expressed as quotas, sometimes they're expressed as targets, but one way or the other, they are party commitments to increasing the number and the proportion of women that are selected by the parties to present to the voters. And we find that 50 plus countries worldwide have these in existence among many different parties. And all of the countries there that I mention have them. And each of these countries has uh, a representation of 30% plus women in their parliaments. And it hasn't happened overnight. It has happened through parties proactively uh, moving uh, in this direction. Uh, and so I think there's a lesson to be learned there for political parties in terms of uh, moving beyond rhetoric and moving to really address the issue of women's underrepresentation. Um, we find that there are many good practices uh, among political parties in this regard. So, for example, um, the Women Can Do It campaign, which is uh, 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 the um, child of the Norwegian uh, Labour Party, um, is actually run not just in Norway, but in over 20 countries worldwide, which trains and supports women um, to become candidates in their uh, uh, parties, uh, uh, for candidates for election in their parties. Um, the Liberal Democrats um, and the Campaign for Gender Balance have recently joined forces um, to mentor potential women candidates. So the role of mentoring is one that can be very um, uh, supportive of encouraging women into political life. And I think mentoring is increasingly one of the important tools to encourage women to uh, overcome the issues such as confidence, as well as some of the other cultural concerns um, that uh, inhibit their participation. So there are many areas uh, in that regard and many good party practices of which uh, they are but some. Um, civil society uh, has been very much to the fore and has been campaigning for a very long time, pressuring parties to uh, address uh, this matter, pressuring assemblies to address uh, this matter as well. And the Northern Ireland uh, civil society is no different uh, in that regard. Um, in terms of uh, different practices, we have, for example, the Women for Election campaign uh, in uh, the Republic of Ireland. The Women for Election campaign is funded by social entrepreneurs. It is uh, uh, not funded from the public purse. Um, it is a campaign and uh, an initiative to train, support and uh, mentor women who wish to seek a role in public life. 
It has been going for two years, and so far it has been uh, it has trained. Um, a quite a significant uh, range of women um, and it has found that 100 of the women that it has trained so far have now been selected as candidates by parties for the upcoming local elections in the Republic of Ireland. Now, without women for election, it would, I am quite sure that those 100 women or many of those hundred women would not um, be selected, would not be standing as candidates today. So there is something around that campaign that is uh, certainly mobilizing women and developing them in such a way that they become very, um, uh, very attractive for parties to stand as candidates. Some of these women are from political parties themselves, some are not from political parties. Um, uh, it's quite a mixture across the board. But even if they do not stand for election, it also allows these women to uh, assume other public roles, to contribute to the governance of the society in different ways, either through uh, being election agents for uh, individual candidates or through considering um, roles on public boards um, and, um, and contributing to decision making more generally. Um, the second um, example that I have here is the Shiriki uh, initiative in the Lebanon, which was supported by the National Democratic Institute of the United States, uh, which obviously supports democracy initiatives across the globe. And here, again, a similar kind of program to give uh, women participants, the networking uh, abilities and the skills to run successful campaigns. Um, so some of the uh, structured programs that I think we could look at quite closely in Northern Ireland to be able to say, well, maybe we could tailor something here in Northern Ireland for uh, women to see how that can support women's representation. There have also been wider public awareness campaigns run by different organizations across time. Um, here on the left-hand side, we see um, rows of men's ties. That was a billboard run, uh, a campaign run by uh, Forum 50% in the Czech 2006 general elections. And the question there in Czech, which nobody can read because it's too small, but I can give you because I have it written here, is do you really have a choice? <coughs> and the whole idea was to prompt voters into thinking whether they had a choice as to the candidate that they could choose for election and to prompt thinking in that regard. A second initiative, again, another billboard campaign, was in Turkey, the one on the right-hand side, where um, uh, posters of well-known uh, businesswomen, um, uh, well-known uh, women public intellectuals, well-known women artists and writers um, were uh, put up on the screen wearing a tie or wearing a moustache. And the question then was, is it necessary to be a man to enter parliament? Again, provoking the uh, debate around uh, who is the parliament for and who does the parliament represent? The, uh, the Icelandic parliament, which I uh, uh, don't present here, um, also uh, had a very um, uh, well-funded uh, and well-supported um, campaign around having a more gender-equal parliament, one element of which was also having a poster campaign that showed um, leading parliamentarians in of one gender in the role of another gender. 
So, for example, it showed uh, the, pr the, the male prime minister um, uh, sitting uh, in a chair trying to try on a pair of high heels. <laughs> and the question is, does the shoe fit? <laughs> so that, was, uh, oh, that attracted a lot of comment and attention. And the female uh, minister for finance was seen looking into the bathroom mirror in the morning with shaving cream and a razor to try and disturb the gender stereotypes that we have about women's and men's roles in society and what women and men can and cannot do and uh, why women and men cannot share multiple roles. So there is a power in the visual in provoking um, uh, these discussions uh, that have been used to excellent effect elsewhere. More recently, a lot of attention has been um, uh, directed to parliaments themselves and parliaments as institutions that themselves embody the gender stereotypes and the gendered culture of the society in which those parliaments are embedded. Uh, parliaments themselves have cultures and work practices that reflect the norms and the values of the society and therefore have their own ingrained gender biases. And one of the first parliaments to address this was the Swedish parliament, where uh, the uh, female speaker um, sought and um, led a gender audit of uh, Swedish parliamentarians uh, and the culture of the parliament and the culture and the practices of the parliament, even though women constituted almost equal numbers with men. So it wasn't just about the numbers and, uh, and the equal numbers, it was about how that parliament went about its business. And in, in, the, in looking in reflecting on how they did their business, women parliamentarians were saying that they felt overlooked, that they were more often interrupted than their male colleagues when they uh, were when they were making speeches in Parliament, um, and um, that they experienced a number of disadvantages, that their male parliamentary colleagues were not themselves reporting as being uh, uh, disadvantages. So the Swedish parliament came up with a 15-point plan for change. And since then, a lot of parliaments have begun to look at their own internal cultures and practices and have shaped uh, reforms and initiatives around three uh, specific areas. One of them being mainstreaming gender in all policies, practices, procedures and considerations of policy, including considerations of uh, of uh, budgets and including considerations of how the resources of the parliament are distributed between male and female parliamentarians. Uh, gender equality and leadership. The, um, the um, um, allocation of committee chairperson roles equally to women and men um, across parties, for example, as an example of sharing leadership resources equally between women and men. And in terms of the induction process uh, for new parliamentarians, um, uh, the, uh, that the induction process address gender equality issues and address uh, um, gender mainstreaming and address, address gender training for all uh, uh, parliamentarians. So um, these are areas that other parliaments have worked on. These are areas that I think um, the Northern Ireland Assembly could um, perhaps uh, reflect on um, uh, in terms of looking at how to increase women's representation because that issue is becoming more and more important in terms of who, do, who 
does, is represented through the Northern Ireland Parliament. And it is an issue because increasingly both women and men are showing that they have less of an interest in politics. But it is quite shocking to see that only one woman in four indicates an interest in politics, where two out of every five men indicates an interest in politics in Northern Ireland today, which basically says that women as a population, as citizens, and as uh, one half of the society that parliamentarians represent don't feel engaged with politics, with political system, with political issues. Now, one may say, well, look, that's path dependent, 30 years of, uh, of uh, um, the troubles have led to all of this, but it was not the same in 1998 when the agreement was signed Look at, the representation, look at the interest levels of women and men in 1998. Um, two thirds of women about, just approximately, and three quarters of men said that they had an interest in politics. So there is quite a drop off. And that is a drop off even in terms of uh, um, not just politics settling down, but in terms of what one would expect um, across um, across Northern Ireland and the rest of uh, uh, the UK more generally. Because the last uh, audit of political engagement, published in 2013, showed that uh, across the UK, men's uh, interest in politics was at 46%, not far from Northern Ireland men. Women's interest in politics was 38% less than that of men, but far ahead of that of women in Northern Ireland. If we look at the European uh, picture, the World Values Study tells us that in terms of interest in politics, men, when they ask the question, stand at about 45% saying that they show an interest in politics. Women, when asked the question, 44% of them say they have an interest in politics. So there is something happening here where uh, Northern Ireland politicians are losing women. And as a matter of demo good democratic practice, and as a matter of showing that the assembly is an inclusive assembly, I think this issue needs to be addressed and needs to be carefully considered for the future. So, I leave my uh, thoughts there and maybe we can have a discussion. Thank you.